good. You gotta try stuff. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Scotland. Another one. I'm Mo. <laughs> so I shared these uh, the link to the slides in um, the VF group just in case you can't see them. I, they've got so many screens here, you probably are fine. But if you want to look at them later, feel free. Um, and if you've got uh, questions, I'll have some time at the end. I, I mean, that there's two presenters, so I don't want to take too much time. Um, get a feel, how many of you all in the room write unit tests or some form of tests regularly, like every day or every week? So you want to write a job. Awesome. Good. It's a good group then. So, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot, a lot of other developers maybe skip this or don't get to because there's not time. Uh, but I'm a huge advocate for testing. Um, I am uh, right now the CTO of a company called the Great Network. Uh, we hook K through 12 teachers up with college students to grade papers for them. And um, that's cool. And text fun. I've been working in the last six years. So if anyone want to talk about that, happy to do afterwards. But today we're going to talk about distributed system testing. So if you're not familiar with the idea of a distributed system, this is uh, Leslie Lamport's a researcher in distributed systems, kind of invented a lot of the modern theory in the field. And I'm not an expert at this at all, but I love this quote anyway. Uh, he says that the distributed system is one in which the failure of a computer you didn't know existed can render your own computer useful. So we see this a lot in web development. Um, you know, typically we're building stuff where we've got a front end, we've separated from a back end, and there may be APIs, one or more or many, uh, powering that front end. And when one of them goes down, if we didn't build things right, it takes the whole system or a large part of the system down. That's something we want to avoid typically. So this is part of the reason that testing these kinds of distributed systems is really important. Uh, I kind of have five reasons I've kind of picked out here. You could probably pick out another half dozen if you really want to take deep, but sort of the top one to keep in mind. So when we're building distributed systems, we want to keep in mind that like fault tolerance is really important. So that whole lesson land mode mode is just going back to that. If something goes down, how's the whole system going to respond? The the next reason I think testing of distributed systems is really important is because you can't control how other services that you rely on use things like semantic versions. So how many of you use an API that is like unversioned as far as you can tell? Yeah, I have a few that I rely on there, you know, not in my control, got no, no power over how it works, how they do updates, right? Um, so testing can help alleviate or at least minimize the risk of relying on that sort of API. Uh, and that also includes, I guess, your internal services as well. I mean, you may have a large team that's distributed and you may all be working uh, similarly, network connections are never perfect. I think server to server in the same data center has gotten pretty good. I mean, I can usually rely on that sort of connection pretty well, but uh, my server to your front end, I really can't rely on that network connection at all. So testing helps us prevent any issues with that or reading that. And then this is kind of tangentially related to distributed systems, but 
because we're building previously using a lot of open source software, we tend to import a lot of packages. I'm going to assume everyone here is familiar with Node Package Manager. Yeah? Got that? Um, so that's something we use in JavaScript, but there's every other language has got its own version of Package Manager, and we are usually going to be pulling in some packages for almost every project. And then finally, when working with siloed teams, so um, distributed systems tend to lend themselves well to siloed teams. What I mean by that is uh, if we've got five APIs that our front end or our uh, clients rely on, we may have five different teams. One of them may be in charge of each API. This is kind of the Amazon or network model of microservices. But a lot of smaller companies adapt the same thing. And the, the challenge there is that we want to make sure that when people leave one team to join another, or let's say they're a new person on a team, they can quickly be onboarded and know how things work. And testing is a great supplement. That's why we want to test distributed systems. And then for the rest of this talk, what I'm going to go over is kind of the introduction to the terminology we use in writing these kinds of tests, um, using those tests in practice, and then we'll go through creating an actual test plan. So uh, there's four layers of tests that I'm going to talk about here today. I'm not going to get into things like performance testing. Uh, I'm not going to get into anything like um, load testing, although those are really interesting topics as well. But since this is just sort of a short talk, I don't want to to run into everything you could possibly cover. So the first layer is unit tests. How many people write unit tests all the time and you only write unit tests as far as you know? A couple people? Okay, cool. So um, it's interesting though looking up the definitions of all these kinds of tests because a lot of people define unit tests as any kind of automated test uh, I would typically though define a unit test as something that tests the smallest unit of code possible, typically a class or a <coughs> So I'm writing a very limited um, sort of spin on what a unit test is. And I would typically say that a unit test needs to mock any external dependencies that it has. So for example, if your unit test is going to be writing files to the file system, you want to mock that file system adapt. The thing that's nice about unit tests is you can write a ton of them for really cheaply and they can run really quickly because you're mocking everything that's like really doing file system I hope. So it's really easy to write a lot of them. And if you look at things like the test pyramid, uh, is anybody familiar with that diagram? It's all like a testing pyramid, and it kind of like starts to go to the top, it's really small, and it's larger, like most pyramids. Um, <laughs> so with, with that, you get a test on the box. And the reason for that is that you write most of them, they're kind of like the core foundation. So it's really important. Uh, the next layer up in these testing layers that I talked about for distributed systems is integration. And with integration tests, what we're trying to validate is that groups or a couple components that we have work together in tandem well. There's a couple reasons that integration tests are useful. Uh, and one is if you have what the legacy system inherited where you don't get control over how they did dependency injection, and so there's no good way to test things in isolation, you can pretty easily, usually easily, get some kind of integration test in that will like test several pieces of the system together. And that's better than nothing. The other reason uh, I like integration tests are things like testing boundaries between services. Uh, and we'll get into this in more detail, but for example, let's say I want to test the way that my model, ORM, and database interact. Because typically I'm going to import an ORM that gives me some form of model uh, that I'm going to use sort of like expecting it to work. But the reality is I want to make sure that that works, even though I may trust my third party package that I'm using or whatever ORM internal we've built. I really want to make sure that I'm actually getting the data, that the filters are being applied as we expect. So integration tests could be really helpful there. The next layer up is acceptance tests. So we're talking about distributed systems here. So we're talking about several services, and maybe several client layers. Uh, an acceptance test will typically wrap one whole service or one whole client layer. Uh, maybe it's a front-end application like an Angular app, or it's a, a, a front-end um, mobile app or whatever. But we want to mock all the external dependencies. And then finally, the last layer is sort of the big one. And this is end-to-end -end tests, which are essentially analogous to quick tests. So if you're not writing automated tests, this might be the only kind of test you're running. It might be full of manual. Um, and I've worked on games where that was unfortunately the situation, and that can be tricky, but it's doable, and if you have to, uh, you can do it. Even if you are writing a fully automated test plan and you've got all the tools in place, end-to-end -end tests are really helpful uh, because even though you may be testing each layer along the way, uh, just ensuring that all the pieces of the system actually work as a whole on a regular basis 
adds a lot of security to um, sort of knowing, or just, I guess, uh, to do a lot of internal security, feeling like you know that things work. For antenna tests, I typically would try to use real data sources as much as possible, so I think actually hitting third-party APIs when I can. And occasionally, when a, a service doesn't allow that sort of thing, I will mock it. So those are the definitions. I've pulled a lot of the, the sort of base uh, of those definitions from uh, this really good presentation that Martin Fowler has out there. You can look at Martin Fowler testing microservices, um, and he, he goes into more depth about each of those layers and how he uses them. Um, but let's talk about how we would use these to test something that we're probably all familiar with. Uh, how many people in here built something on an MVC style architecture? So model view controller. It's kind of like one of those kind of web developer 101 things that, that everybody gets to do the, the basic tutorial. If you've done the tutorial of Rails, it walks you through what all those features mean. So it's a good place to start with testing. So let's say we've got a simple MVC monolith all on one <laughs> server. For the sake of this example, we're just all on one instance. So we're not even worried about the duplication. We're not worried about load balancing. Let's keep it real simple. This might be the way we would set up our test for it. So we might test uh, models, controllers, and the router. Uh, we would have unit tests around them. We're going to test each method to make sure that internally all the business logic or whatever uh, logic we've got in there works well. We would also have some integration tests. Typically, the, the area where I see the most use out of an integration test is something as simple would be between the model and the database. And what that's going to do is allow me to say that I have a user's model and I know it's connected to a post model. Uh, if I want to say, get me users with posts, I want to ensure that the data that comes back is formatted correctly. Even though we're relying on the ORM, it's supposed to work. Let's just check the whole thing in, in the near integration test to ensure it. The next layer up is the acceptance test, which for this, I would typically try to mock the database in some way. And that may be injecting some kind of, um, of sort of a mock version of your ORM or whatever the model itself. And then I would test all the way to the view to make sure that the uh, data that comes through on the front end is what I expect. And then the last layer, the sort of biggest layer, is testing the whole thing end to end. Cool, so I'll take a break for just a second on this. Yeah. So you can do So let's go through the process of how we might make a plan to test this sort of thing. 
And we're basically just going to first worry about one pathway at a time. So um, in practice, you know, you're working very much into these little segments, but I think it's good to take a step and look, step back and look at the high level. So let's isolate each pathway, break it down into layers, much like we did with the MVC architecture. And then for each layer or each service, we're going to test internal functionality and external functionality or connection. All right, so how do we isolate a pathway in this sort of system? Um, I'm going to sort of take some liberties and say that this is just a single pathway that goes from the front end, gets all my users from the database, it merges in some data from a third party service, and then displays them out to an admin. Yeah, when you say pathway, you put a use case or you put yeah. Yeah, so let's say that this is more of like a, I'm the admin, I render one view, and that's what you would do like 10 views or something like that. So whatever, I guess it's one uh, functional unit of code. Right? Yeah. So at the end of the day, what we care about is what's rendered to the user, but behind the scenes there's all this stuff going on, we need to like think about that. So here's like a uh, more, um, uh, I guess a more linear version of that same um, pathway break it down into how data goes from uphill to downhill, or downhill to uphill, depending on how you want to say it. And then let's look at each of the layers inside of each of those services. So uh, we'll dig into these in detail, but we've basically got three main services that we want to test. We've got our front-end application, a back-end application, and a shared package. So let's start back with our uh, internal packages. So, if, if our internal package, all it is is, let's say, an HTTP client we wrote to connect to some third-party API, uh, then it's just simple. It may be simple. It may just be one class that has some helper methods that wrap um, whatever knows HTTP calls. And then it's going to go back to the third-party API, get some data, maybe format it nicely, and then try to present it out to whoever requested it. Unit tests are obviously important if there's a lot of business logic in that actual HTTP client we wrote. Um, you may or may not feel the need to do that depending on your or not, but for a unit test, we want to mock all that backend API data that came through. And then the other piece of this that I think is important is the integration between the HTTP client and the actual third party service. So with integration tests here, I would typically use the actual call, like actual calls to that third party service so that we could get real data from them and see how it works. This is where we can catch breaking changes in their API before they hit all of our users. So we can run this kind of test, this integration test on our package. Probably a pretty lightweight set of tests. We run it every hour, every month, every week, whatever we think is necessary, depending on the criticality of the system and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing I would just automate to set up and run all the time. And whenever that fails, if I have an integration test failure between my HTTP client and third party service, it's telling me if something went down outside of our system, but it's going to, it could take down a lot of things. Um, another thing that's important to talk about here is when doing these unit tests on the HTTP client, um, test the unhappy cases. So I think one of, one of my bosses one time um, kind of was teaching me a lot about testing, and he said, before you write any of the happy cases, which means the success case where everything goes through and it's 200, uh, I think a status message, test all the error codes that you could get or all the, the bad responses from the API, and make sure that your unit test covered those as well. And I think those are actually more important a lot of times than the, the happy case, which is, you know, with, it's the, kind of the gimme. Then we kind of move up the chain. We've got the back end um, API that we built, and it's relying on this internal package and the database connection. And it's, so we're going to do the same thing we kind of did with the MVC. We're going to unit test the controller, the router, maybe the model, depending on how much logic we have living in there. And then integration test that connection between the database and the model to get our ORM, make sure we've got all that going right. And then do an integration test on the connection between either our controller or model, whichever one you So for this integration test, I would typically try to mock that third-party API because our goal here is to test that our backend service actually imports this internal package as we expect and uses it correctly. The other, the previous test, this one wants to test whether that third-party service is giving us the data we expect. And then moving up to the front end, once again we want to integration test the sort of connection between the front end and the back end to make an actual call to an instance of our back end service. Um, this is where things like having a uh, some kind of 
container-based build system really helps because you can spin those up really quickly. Uh, and if not, then you can, another way I've done this before when we had to was just have a whole testing environment with all of our services kind of like running all the time. Uh, and then we would just call that as our sort of back end. So that's another way you can do it. Uh, and then unit test each of the layers. For this, I'm kind of using the um, Angular 2.4 uh, method of architecture. So it's like this data stores and architecture store and components. But whatever your layers are in your front end application, same thing. Mm -hmm. And then we accept and test the whole thing while mocking the back end service. So this is like the whole, the whole kit and caboodle together. Um, and then we finally, like the only thing I've added here is let's end to end test everything that we can. Um, you know, end to end tests are, they seem like they would be really great because you could just catch anything that goes wrong ever, right? But if you ever try to write and maintain an end to end test suite, it's really comprehensive. You know how expensive in time that can be. Uh, a tool that I've come to love lately is called Ghost Inspector because um, it actually will let you do like record quick tests in your screen. And so, like, your junior devs and QA people can. Do that without a lot of developer support, just sort of ten. Uh, but a lot of people use things like Selenium, which is really good for those end to end tests as well. All right, so let's just kind of do a quick look at how those layers fit together again, and then I'll, I'll get off stage and um, we'll keep moving on. Uh, so, first of all, unit test, we're, we're trying to get each one of our services tested in isolation, the smallest unit of code we can tested inside of them. With integration tests, we're really focused on the layers between the services or between services and backends that go behind them. And then with the acceptance test, we're trying to ensure that each application or each service, whichever it is, um, works in tandem without the external connections. And then our end to end tests are kind of trying to test the whole thing in conjunction with everything else. Awesome. So I'm, uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. And uh, if you want to see this again, I'll be giving this at API Straps conference that Linux Foundation puts on in Portland. And uh, does anyone have any questions? Anything else I can answer? Yes, sir. I thought you were going to run examples, like a short example. Yeah, so that's pretty much what we've got with all this. I don't have any code examples. Okay. Today. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I had that. Did you see this last time at the Angular meetup? Ah, uh, you a lot different. It was. It was. It's, this has undergone many iterations. This is a lot better. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 So when uh, I, I I would I think that all these terms first of all are like pick the terms you like and if your whole team agrees on it that's fine like there's not a, unfortunately there's not a consensus on what these terms are so this is not just me being weird this is like I've looked at three or four different podcasts on this topic and every one of them I think I've got some other terms so but for me the distinction is um, integration tests are typically trying to test one or two classes together that are closely linked uh, but Whereas an acceptance test is just trying to test one whole system in isolation. So it's like you take that one microservice without any back end connection that it relies on and just test the difference. But then we also want to test that at the integration level that it works with the thing that's integrated. If that kind of adds like, any clarity. Like the units, like the larger, like the units versus like how it is. Yeah. How, how they talk to each other. Exactly. Yeah, that's the way I try to define the difference. And, you know, this kind of comes down to if your team is doing a highly distributed architecture, then you need some um, common language for what those tests mean that are testing these links, right? So we call these integration tests. Um, and acceptance tests are more just like, let's test this one service with the package it has, but not worry about how it connects to the database. Yes, sir. Well, how do we affect the result from a integration type of a test? To a unit test. So, in essence, we are pretty much you know, sit together and find that it works on an item and then kind of realize that you want to see it and pull it up and I read some classes out of it. And now you pretty much, you can read the test if you read it. It's going to work because you have a factor. But it runs from a unit test into integration, integration, integration test. Mm -hmm. So, now what is the best way? Cut down on the wasted time to basically re uh, either reimagine the, the, the testing or um, 
Well, how do you handle it? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. So um, I would sort of turn that around and ask, do you need to change? You're, if, your test is, if, if your test is green, you refactor, your test is still green, you need to change that test. Is it, is it, did it lose something? No, and actually okay. that would be a very, very cool way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> you pretty much leave it and it works, right? Yeah. Uh, but then again, you expect uh, you know one subject to be unified, and it will be doing the that. Yeah. So now, um, granted, I mean, you can kind of decide that if one is going to start partitioning it off, and then you can actually uh, re uh, refactor the uh, the unit the unit the test the test themselves. But yeah. in real life, what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you guys deal with it? How do I deal with it? Yeah. So, it to me, it would depend on. If there's a lot of added value by breaking that, you know, what became an integration test down into unit tests as well, or if it accomplishes all the goals that I think it needs to without doing it. Um, you know, the test, building a test plan is great, but the real world is always a little more complicated. So I think the way I've always approached it is to write a test plan along with my initial, like, sort of ideal architecture up front, so I have some idea where I'm heading. But the reality is we take a lot of steps to get there, and those steps aren't, like, continuous. And sometimes we leap over a, a whole layer of tests that we didn't need or you know, realize that aren't adding that much value. So I don't have an exact answer. I think it's always like weighing off those trade-offs of how important is this, if this really works, and that how much value does that new test or whatever add to the system. So that's kind of the, the equation that I have in my mind. Does anybody else have a better way to handle that? Very, I'm very open to suggestions. Okay, so, well, next one is, <laughs> yes. so how do you actually name those test suites? So for the test, yeah. this value-oriented <laughs> yeah, yeah. choice of uh, implementation of the test. Yeah, I, you know, I haven't encountered that exact situation where I was going from, like, a unit to an integration test like that. Um, but I think I would try to rename it if I could, and if not, I would maybe write a note on it that said, yeah, this is still called a unit test, but it's kind of an integration test. I mean, so one thing the other is, is some people expect to basically write a training test, yeah. there's an integration test, and then you cannot imagine <coughs> how it's supposed to be solved, and then you basically progress to the unit test all the way through. The problem is that you're going to go from uh, the uh, um, acceptance test to the integration test to mm -hmm. uh, unit test, and now you have to remember three layers of the way that you can yeah. envision the solution. Gonna, yep. you know, materialize, yeah. and that's quite a lot to it is. it is, and I think that using all of these layers in any one application or one pathway of an application is probably the, towards the like high end of testing. Like it's more testing than a lot of applications need. Because a lot of times some of these layers are gonna be just passed through, right? Like, um, you know, I may have a, uh, a model that, or a controller that really doesn't do much logic just like calls a model method that I know works. So in that case, do I need to unit test everything in that controller? Maybe not, you know? Um, so I've always been very like pragmatic about if we're not doing any logic and it doesn't add value, then I don't, you know, I don't see the need to add a test there just because we normally do a test there. It just seems a little like blind, you know, blindly following. I mean, Cover still can help you with the highlights here on like, you know, switches and if statements. Yep. Um, yep. They basically have a one line without no line, you can one highlight yeah. it, right? Yeah. As long as, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. as long as you call the method, it will be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then you hope that if you've built a couple other layers beyond that, like an integration test or an acceptance test over it, that it's sort of going to catch some of those like major naming errors or something, or your ID will catch it. So, how do you organize your uh, test file? Do you like uh, keep them in the same directory as, like, say, your controller and your like, t test controller? Control yeah. So, or like, you do like a separate folder? Like, yeah. Uh, with folder. you know, I've normally done it like it's got its own separate folder at mm -hmm. the root where it's testing, and then okay. you've got a folder for unit test, folder for integration, folder right. for acceptance, and then it kind of follows the same um, the same pattern as the application does. Yeah. Um, but then lately, I've been using Angular four, and that's you know, they want you to have the tests in there with the, uh, the components and with the services. And so I'm not opposed to that view. I think I'm still getting used to it. And I 
don't prefer it necessarily, yeah. but I'm playing by the rules. I think maybe you can go up four because it's basically all the tests on front end should be unit tests. Yeah. Like, well, you're not going to really run, run integration or anything. Right. Like, it's so, all unit. That's why it can run faster. You can yeah. the same folder. Yeah, and you can run integration tests. I actually do quite a bit of integration tests between um, components and directives, oh, okay. components and pipes. Yeah, but because, you don't hit yeah. external, so you're not, doing, yes, yeah. you're not like hitting <coughs> actual APIs yes. on the front end. So yeah, it's they will less run likely. fast. They will yeah. run fast. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. What would you consider prop types in uh, React? Prop types? Yeah. Well, I don't know much about React. Okay. Does anybody know what a prop type in React? Oh, okay. So. <laughs> I'm a really big fan of TypeScript with Angular 4 just because of the type checking, the strongly typed stuff. This is kind of my first time working like heavily in a strongly typed language like that. And um, so I don't think it eliminates the need for tests. I think there's a big talk about strongly typed versus unit tests and like they're mutually exclusive, but they're not. Uh, they're just a different thing. They can help for sure, but they're not like going to replace checking over logic and loops and things like that that you need to. Yes? Um, uh, by the way, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so you yeah. Can speak yeah thank you all so much. Yeah, and you have Yeah, I was just curious. So you mentioned sort of the difficulty in maintaining end to end testing tweets and all that stuff. In your mind, is there anything unique to? Writing maintainable testing code as opposed to other code, or are all the principles really? That's yeah. That's a really good question. I would I would actually love to learn more about writing good maintainable testing code. One of the biggest challenges I find myself, or biggest like problems I see with my test suites lately, has been like repeated code that I know could get pulled out into its own like you know shared methods or classes or whatever. But I just have always like been on this fence about whether I should do that within tests. Um, I've started doing it some, like I have some now test helpers that I've been using a lot, uh, especially in Angular, but, um, and then I've even done a little of like writing an abstract test class that everything extends that has some other methods that might be really commonly used, or like an abstract acceptance test based class that does, like has some prep work for all my acceptance tests, or integration tests, uh, whatever. So I've done some of that, but I think that's an area where I could still learn. I would love to hear if anyone has resources. I think there's a speed, like if you have really yeah. slow running tests, it's always going to be hard to maintain. Yeah. Just That's true too. Slow feedback, you, know, you have to wait yeah. a lot to right. fix it. And the more you can like run just a piece of your test suite rather than the whole thing every single time, I think that helps me a lot too. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll say a couple of good things. Always make sure your, your tests are fully independent, and that can often be tricky with mocks where you're setting up a mock and then changing its state over the on the unit test, um, especially if the unit test fails and doesn't clean up after itself. So there's a couple of, if you get into good habits around that, it gets just a lot easier to do what you just said of like, one of these three tests. Yes. Yeah. They don't depend on each other. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Uh, hello, yeah. everyone. My name is Dan Rodney. Um, so I'm going to talk about server sent events, which is one of a um, variety of ways that a server can send. Um, data uh, to front-end points. For anyone who's hoping for a, uh, a blistering polemic against every other way to do it, you're not going to get that from me. That's not really how it works. Everything's right for the right problem. Um, so, but I will say that this is, the service end events are a good fit for a particular set of use cases. All right, so I'm going to talk about like what service end events are, um, why you might use them, approach, uh, the anatomy of a service site, uh, sent event, and then we'll, we'll look at how you, um, how service sent events work on the front end, and then also how they work on the back end, and then I'll actually show you an example of a very, very simple application that you um, If you have any questions at any point, please put your hand up and I'll answer them. Um, and I will be showing some code, so I, I don't know what the sort of skill level here is. Um, so if you have any questions about like what's actually happening in the code, please do feel free to answer that. This is a meetup. It's supposed to be for everyone at all levels, so there are no uh, 
I'm excessively rooted in two problems. Now it's necessary. All right, so what are our service sent events? So these are events that are sent uh, by the server to the browser. Uh, so it's unidirectional, it is only from the server to the browser. Uh, it is an HTTP protocol. Uh, there's nothing uh, really special about it. It's sort of um, layered on top of HTTP. And it is supported in Chrome, Firefox, Safari, uh, both mobile and desktop uh, versions, and also the Android browser. What a surprise, Microsoft is next for it is not on there. Um, but I will talk about like how you can uh, work around that. Um, it's a way to send free form data from the server to the client. So there's nothing um, beyond uh, a little bit of um, boilerplate. You can actually send whatever you want. You're basically just sending text. Uh, and because of how browsers are implemented, there is a lot of automatic error recovery and reconnection. Uh, and that is actually one of the reasons service sent events are great if they're a good fit. The amount of code you need to write in order to kind of make it sufficiently robust is very, very low. Okay, so why might you use service sent events? So here are the options that exist other than service sent events. So there's polling, that old venerable technique of just hit the back end and say, you got anything for me? You got anything for me? Um, that's fine, but generally, like, you, you don't need to do that. There are plenty of solutions to any problem that you might have that are better than polling. But if you're doing something quick and dirty, it's great. It is both quick and it is good. Um, so long polling, for those of you who don't know, is when you send a request to the back end um, and then you leave the connection open and the server kind of just sends you stuff um, as and when it has it. So you need to manage that. If you're implementing long polling, there needs to be a fair amount of connection and um, data trunk management. And you can probably use a library to do that, but that's an option for you. Uh, there are web sockets, but web sockets require you to have a web socket that is able to serve it, so that's a thing. Fine. Um, there are web hooks, so that's a way for external services to send you stuff. Um, so that's probably not something you're going to use in the browser, but it is a way for um, getting notified of external um, third party events. There's HTTP streaming, setting up a stream and then consuming that stream and sort of passing it up. Um, and then there's applets, right? If you want, uh, you could run Java or Flash or Silverlight in your browser, and all of those have for um, doing um, data flow. All options, some and some are bad choices for some problems, and some are great choices for some problems. So I'm not going to say anything bad about any of those. Uh, and that's why I'm not famous on the internet. Uh, okay, so why would you use service set events? They are very easy to implement. I'll show you the code. They are super, super easy. They're actually very easy to debug. I'm going to show you my example in Chrome. And Chrome actually, in the dev tools, natively recognizes that something is a service side event stream, and it actually interprets that data for you in the dev tool uh, console. Uh, not console, uh, network tab. You don't actually need any special server connect, uh, configuration. Um, there's a couple of things, actually, that you need to do if you've got an Nginx proxy in front of your application server. But it's not special, and you're not. It's not weird. Uh, and I'll show you the examples uh, in the example. Um, and with the exception of IE, which is probably the most unnecessary thing anyone ever has to say, it's a standing thing. Um, it has good browser support. Uh, all of the uh, modern browsers support this pretty well. Uh, and there is a polyfill available for Internet Explorer, which is sufficient. All right, so. What does a service side event look like? Uh, that, actually, that's three events. Um, so at the very least, an event has a uh, sort of a data field, and it's simply the string data followed by a column, and then anything, any old text. Um, UTF-8 encoded probably, although uh, my guess is you can use other character sets if you need to for uh, what follows. Um, you can also name your event, so if you use an event, um, I'm going to call it a tag, it's probably got a field, an event field. If you have an event field, you can name the event, and if you have multiple data fields, um, that will all get bundled up together, and each line will be connected by a new line character. Um, the, the separator between events is a double new line. So essentially, here's a bunch of lines, then double new line, that's the end of my event. 
Um, you can also give your events a numeric ID. Um, those IDs don't have to be unique. Uh, the ID actually only really means anything to the back end. What the front, the front end does with the ID is just keep track of the last one it got. So that when it reconnects, it can send that information to the server and say, hey, the last ID I got was this. Um, the IDs are not namespaced to events. So if you had uh, an event with an ID 1, and then another event of the same type as ID 2, and then an event of a different type of ID 1, it's just going to log that as well. the last one with 1. So that's um, and then comments, uh, if you just have a colon, anything after that is a comment. Do your IDs have to be numerical, did you say, or could they be strings? That's a good question. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. This is one of the, I will say, many specifications coming out of W3, which is really easy to read, and so that would tell you. So I would say numeric is probably sufficient. Yeah. That's it. All right. So um, on the front end, so it all hinges around this object called event source. Event source, as you might imagine, extends event emitter. So anything that you can call on the event emitter, you can call on event source. And it also has these three properties, um, on open, on error, and on message. So you can assign a function to those, uh, each of those, and they will be called um, when the connection is open, if the connection errors out. Or <clears throat> on message will be called for any event of any kind. It's just a grab bag catch all for any event that comes in. What is really nice, though, is that you can do this. Once you have your event source, we give it the URL uh, for your event stream. You can add event listeners. And so anything coming over the uh, server-side event stream that has event column ping will be handled by ping handle. So you've got a, a standard event interface to data that's streaming to you from the back end. Freaking awesome, go. Um, that's it. That's all you would have to do. You don't need to use the on error, on open, or uh, on message. Uh, I mean, generally, I wouldn't use on message for anything other than Oh shit, we got some data that we didn't have a handle for, so. Uh, error handling, so there is an on error handler and that's useful for keeping track of whether or not you actually have a connection to the back end, so if the server goes down or if there's some kind of error. Um, but it's connection based, the on error handler will fall. But by and large, it's mostly automatic. I'm gonna show you um, what happens when I run my front end uh, with my back end going and then just shut down my server and the front end will handle it and then spin up my server again and the front end will also handle that. And I don't actually have to write any code in order to do that. Um, and then like I said, there's the last event ID header. So if you're sending IDs, if there's a reconnection, in that connection event uh, request, there will be a header called last event ID and that's how the front end says the back end. This is where I was when I last so um, if you've got unique IDs and you have some kind of buffer that you can replay, then that might be something you want to do. Yes. Yeah, as long as you're sending IDs with your events, if there is a reconnection event, it automatically will set that head. So for IE support, um, there's a polyfill out there. There's actually a couple of polyfills, Remy Sharp one and someone called Gapple. Um, uh, so just use that polyfill. Uh, and it just uses polling, so that's what it does. So it just pulls the back end, um, but it presents the same interface, so you don't need to, you, that's the whole point of these things, you don't need to worry about actually how it's getting the screen, it will pass it out to you. All right, so on the back end, you need to set these HTTP headers. So you need to send the content type to text slash event stream, Probably want to set the chart set to UTF-8 as well, uh, but I didn't put that in because it wrapped and I, I kind of got a little bit OCD about it. Um, generally, it doesn't make any sense to cache a screen, so turn that off. Uh, you might want to put people live on the connection because it's possibly going to be open for a long time. Um, if your uh, event source is at a different domain or a different port, then you'll I mean, you might want to do something a little bit more sophisticated than throw a star on there, but uh, do um, do uh, cross origin request support. Um, this one is actually a uh, it's an engine X um, uh, header, 
so if you are proxying through a web server, you're probably going to need to look into any uh, little tweaks that you need to do to make sure that your, even if your application server is nailing it, if your proxy server is uh, misconfigured, then you're not going to be able to speed events. And so you will need HTTP version 1.1. So this is something I found on the hard way uh, through Nginx. So that's something you will need to set. But that's it. And then none of that's weird. Um, and this will probably be set by your application server, but if you're proxying, you might need to do that. Um, in order for the IE workarounds, uh, the first thing you need to do is send a two kilobyte comment straight away. So that can be white space, it can be a diatribe against Internet Explorer or anything between those two ends of the spectrum. Um, and also it needs to um, send a heartbeat out so that the um, polyfill can detect uh, disconnects. So neither of those are hard to do. You'll see that the code that I'm about to show you, but it's good stuff. Um, so I'm about to show some code examples. So before I do that, are there any questions about what you're doing? Yes. What's the difference between the functionality and the Well, so WebSocket is so if you need bidirectional communication, this is not an option. Um, in terms of, well, you'll see the code, so I can show you the code and then you can ask that question, it's still banned. Um, I actually haven't done much with WebSockets, I've not needed to, uh, but in terms of setting this up, it's, it's a walking path. So, and you don't, because I think with WebSockets, that's not HTTP, so you need a WebSocket to enable the server, if I'm not mistaken. So that's another thing, yeah. So, so um, yeah, if you're doing unidirectional, it's from the server to the client, I would say have a really good look at this. If you're doing bidirectional, then don't. Um, although it depends on what your bidirectionality is, right? So you can also do uh, service end events from the back end. Right? So if 90% of your flow is from the server, you can do that and then do the fault to the back end. If you want to. So it depends on like the direction. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, how does it handle that if you have uh, two instances of a backend and uh, let's say Nginx it load balances it? Uh, so let's say it's just like sends to one another, one another backend. How it's going to manage the IDs and stuff like that? Yeah. So um, so once you connect, the connection stays open. So there's no load balancing between the events. Um, in terms of handling um, the last end event, uh, yeah, you need to, if you've got multiple backend servers that are being load balanced and you want to handle reconnections properly, then yes, you're going to need to have some comments kind of managing that. So if I'm a client and I get ID number 25 and then I drop and then I reconnect and I send ID number 25, both of these instances need to be able to handle that. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a persistent connection, so you don't need to worry about um, moving between servers uh, for any one. I think uh, with, uh, with WebSocket, like socket I, uh, to do something, you have to have a library that connects to Redis, and Redis stores like, uh, caches from all the backends kind yeah. of state. So I'm not sure if there's a library to do this. Um, not, so not immediately for event. Event sockets are pretty, uh, sorry, um, server-side events are pretty low level, so okay. there's not much. Okay. Any integration you either get from a third party? Yeah, that's what he's yeah. saying. It would be like a sticky connection, like one kind of like once it's doing the server side of that, it would just keep going to the same backend, right? Um, right, but then for the, if there's a reconnection, reconnect. then yeah, you might want to load balance. So, which would, uh, you know, the reconnection will, if it's transient, so let's say you have an HTTP timeout, because ultimately you will. Sooner or later, if you've got someone who connected to your site and then went away for a week and then came back, they probably had a few reconnection events because just the HTTP timeout got hit. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, load balance is probably configured to the back there. Yeah. But I wouldn't want to rely on that. Um, and if you need um, robust reconnection, then you're probably going to have something on the other end, instance on the back end, that's holding the event. You mentioned there could be a stack, like different browsers are going to be a stack, or the browser is going to be a stack? Oh, no, no, there's no, there aren't complete stacks. No, uh, no, just the stack. Like, I don't know if anyone spent much time looking at the stack. Those groups of 
and large they are very consumable. It's rare that you actually need to read them because there's usually a lot of really good documentation out at a slightly higher level, but that's actually pretty awesome. So, um, and this one's a short one because I mean you saw I could fit everything on one page. So um, no, there's no Someone in comment there support this. Yeah, you can send whatever you want. It's a no, but they come, the first thing they from the web app to the service. Yes, yeah, yeah. You can from the web app to the service. It's just an HTTP get. Oh, well, that's so basically whatever you want. But it's probably a get you can send any headers, you can send any data yeah. throughout any query terminal you want in the back end. You can send that. Yeah. Um, there's nothing special about it. The only thing that doesn't really make sense is having to do that with text. That sounds like a really philosophical question. Why would you cash a screen? All right, so let's start with the back end. So, what I created was a little. Um, uh, hang on a second. All right, so what I've created is a very, very simple application that simulates a haunted house, uh, which is to say, it seems timely, um, which is to say it just like randomly sends haunted house events and then the front end just kind of wants them off. So there's nothing really coming up with it. So I've used Koa. Anyone who doesn't know what Koa is, it's a web <coughs> framework. Um, uh, you don't need to know about Koa in order to understand this, but if you've used Express, then you'll probably Um, I've written, so all of this is, I'm, there's a GitHub uh, link at the end of this. All of this is on GitHub, and you can steal anything I've written because it's unlicensed in the sense that it has an unlicensed license on it. Um, I wrote a, uh, a package that sort of encapsulates a lot of the uh, uh, server side event stuff for you. Um, here are the events, here's the thing we'll get a random event, and then we can set up our client, um, connect my middleware, and then Okay, great. So here we go. So all this supports, the only thing it supports is a get to slash events. Um, so we'll set up our, set up our connection. Um, this is just the request context that we pass in. Um, and then all we have is a little function here that if the connection isn't dead, it will send an event called spooky with an incremental ID, and then we'll just get a random event that we'll send out. And then we'll set it up to do it again in some sort of random period of time. We also keep track of whether or not the connection has been destroyed, which means that the front end is disconnected from us. And if we do, we mark it as dead. That's to make sure that if we try and send an event on a destroyed connection, then the server will just fall over. So we do need to kind of do a little bit of cleanup. Um, and then we call that just to set it up. Um, and that's it. So any questions about that? We'll get into what's in here in a second, but any questions about what's happening? If someone does a get, we set up a server side event connection and then we send events over it and stuff like that. Oh, All right, so this is the, um, the server side event uh, class. So, um, just to avoid confusion, so this is extending event emitter just for good management. This has got nothing to do with server side events. This is just me creating a module that can send events to. So don't let that. Um, so yeah, so all we do is, um, so the context, yeah, so that, that's coming from the web server. So the first thing that we do is that we set the timeout of the request context to the biggest number that we can, because we're expecting to keep this connection for open for as long as possible. Um, and so that's what that does. 
like I said, if someone connects and they stay on for days and days and days, sooner or later the connection will time out, but that doesn't matter because the browser will then just reconnect. So. Um, the next thing we do is we get a reference to the actual socket itself, and we just make sure that we know when the connection socket gets closed for whatever reason, and we handle it ourselves. Appropriately. Uh, logging. All right, and then we set up the response. So the response is a 200. Um, we set up the type as before. We set up those headers as before. Um, and then instead of setting the body to a string or an object, which is usually what you do in a node web um, application server, we actually connect it to a stream. And if this is just a pass-through stream, which is a, a stream that does nothing. Um, so that that's how we... Uh, sort of are able to stream stuff out is we set the body of the response to a stream of our own. Um, the next thing we do is that we set the padding to make IE happy. And then this is the thing that sets up the heartbeat to keep IE happy. So that will make it happy and that will keep it happy. All right, then the padding is just going to send two kilobytes. That's not interesting at all. All right, so this is the code that sends the event. So um, what it's receiving is an event name and then just an object. So we JSONify the object, and then um, the padding has we send, we send it, and then all we do is we write an ID, and then write the event, and then we write the JSONify data, and that's it. So it's just simple string writes, and you'll see there's the double, um, double new line which closes out the event. Uh, and then we increment the ID, and that's it. Um, and then this is just a little bit of housekeeping on the back end to uh, uh, handle when socket gets disconnected. Any questions about that? Um, there are lots of code examples, very simple code examples of how to do this in your language of choice, given that you're all JavaScript people, I would imagine someone would choose this. Um, but that's uh, 140 lines and you've got your SEC connection. So, okay. This is the front end. So this is React, but there's nothing particularly magically react -y here. Um, so basically, I've got an application component, and, and, and that's that's it. That's everything. Um, okay. So the first thing we do is create an event source, and we give it the URL of the event source. Log it. Uh, I cannot. No, I don't know how to make it. Uh, well, control yeah. class maybe or something. Like that. No. I don't know how to do it. It's a web store, if anyone knows how to. Is it in view? There's like a... Uh, yeah, I spent some time trying to do this. Uh, mm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, sorry, but if this is available on GitHub too, I need to check it out there. All right, so um, we create an event source, and we tell it what the event source is, and then we just add an event listener. So the name of my event is Spooky, um, and we're getting... Uh, an object in which is, it's got um, a data property, an event and an event property. So I just parse the data, and then um, what this is doing is, I have a, um, this uh, component has some state, so I'm basically just appending the new event to my state, uh, event state property. Uh, sorry, my event state. Um, and then um, I have attached on open and on error, just purposes of logging, you don't need to do that, but this will kind of tell me when I'm connected and not connected. Uh, and that's it. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, line oh. Um, all right, let's see in action. Okay. The first thing we're gonna do is set up my All right, oh, no connection. And it's going to keep sending no connection because it's going to try and reconnect every now and again. So that's why I keep it. All right, so let's stop the back. Does it have any kind of smart like slowdown on that, or is it just every second period? Yeah. It does not. But um, this is supposed, that's supposed to be a pretty exceptional. Like you shouldn't really have yeah. a front end that can't connect to the back end. And if, if that's common, you probably want to handle that. Yeah. All right, so now. Uh, connected, yay! Now we're just getting random events um, from the backend. So what I can do is kill the backend, 
Dale. And it doesn't have uh, okay, which is great if you want to do online maintenance and you need to bounce an event server. Your, your uh, clients will handle it no problem. Alright, so here's the fun thing. If I go to my network tab, refresh. Uh, here is uh, so you'll see that it's a, an event source. Um, and Chrome understands the event streams, and so it will give you that lovely little um, just, uh, rendering of, so, sorry if you can't read it, but it, it's doing a very nice job of just rendering all the events as they come in. So that's a really nice thing to do. Debugging it tells you what time they came in, and it recognizes IDs, events, and then data. Um, that's it, that's it though, that's server-side events. So it's a really nice way for unidirectional notification and stuff on the back end. I've used it, I have an application where people can make appointments, and so if I'm a physician and I'm looking at my dashboard, if someone makes an appointment, um, it will hit my back end, and my back end, it will um, it'll write to a Redis instance and then publish to a, a, a channel, and then I have something that is subscribed to that channel and then services those Event. So people will get immediate notification when you uh, appointments come in or patients arrive for that appointment. So it's a nice way to um, have a dashboard that's giving you pretty up-to-date um, notifications of changes in state. Um, if you want to, you can steal any of that. Um, so yeah, so JS Chai Service and Events, and I'm Dan Crum. Um, like I say, it is. Public domain license, so if you want to use that module, go ahead. Um, if you want to submit a pull request for any of the shittiness in it, please do, because uh, I kind of smashed it together. Um, and that is it. Are there any questions? Yes. What do you mean by using a solution event over a Like, I know you were using the version of the pipe version, but why would you want to use the version of the pipe version? Because you might, it, it might feel the direction. So um, I, I have no problems about throwing out IoT because that's the little TLA that everybody loves, right? So if you've got a system with a whole bunch of um, sensors and, sorry, Internet of Things, if anyone's not uh, familiar with that. So sensors and transducers and stuff like that. You might have a whole field of sensors, but they are unidirectional. They only send data into your system. So if you have a dashboard that's tracking those, like you you only need a stream of events coming from the server. There's no stream of events going back. And you can probably manage um, any communication back to the server by the standard call. Again, I think it's, it boils down to like what is the quantity of uh, events flowing from the server versus uh, to the server. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, does this end up being like um, slightly less load than polling because you're not like constantly opening a new connection? Is that, that, is that someone stands there? Yeah, although it's a change of load, right? Yeah. So with that, uh, there's the, the load of establishing the connection, but then the connection is closed. Yeah. Um, it's probably most comparable with long polling in that you open a connection. So there is a risk there. If, you, if you're a connection constrained, then if you have a highly popular um, service that is streaming at events, then that would be the risk. But yeah. there are plenty of systems that can handle that, so you, know, you just need to size appropriately. Um, yeah. Well, one thing that is interesting is that the event source is an event source, and so uh, there's some interesting possibilities with um, testing. Like, uh, you could kick out the event source and actually just have a, an event emitter that is events that look right, and so there's some probably some interesting opportunities either with testing or um, different event images in different device environments. So I, that's as far as that thought has got for me, because I can't <laughs> quite think exactly how it would work, um, but it could. Um, yeah, or, or if you have, um, if you want, because you can tr just treat it as an event emitter, if you have different types of event emitters, like maybe there's one that's on a timer, and maybe there's one that's Responding to user event uh, actions and then one responding to back end, it might be useful to be able to sort of bundle those together and say this thing just keeps out events and it doesn't work out where they came from. That's that's a nice thing. You don't need, there's nothing about the event source that is inherently um, HTTP except for the initial moment when you set up the URL after that. It's all events. That's 
actually a phone that's like storing the, does it just store them indefinitely? Will it ever hit a, like, will it start resetting at some point? Yeah, so I, pr pr uh, Chrome probably will, but sooner or later this HTTP connection, HTTP connection will all time out. So that's what we're having. So that would be good. And then all that would happen is it would just come in. And do you know if there's a max size for each event? Uh, I do not. <clears throat> do not. Okay. I don't, I would, I doubt the spec has one, but that might be some practical. Right, that's right. Oh, you might be interested, or not, but let's see anyway. <laughs> uh, this is just what the, what the world thing is like. So, there's really nothing special about it. Yeah. It's a good request. So you'll see the heartbeat coming through. So the heartbeat is, uh, oh, it's off the edge. The heartbeat is just on it. Any other questions? So, it's going to be on a phone and the arrow to go to the top from the comments, or is it going to be a chat to the No, so uh, I think it's destroyed. Like, if you destroy it, that's it. But um, if it disconnects because of some disruption, it will also be like, Yeah, you saw all the code that's running, by the way. I haven't glossed over anything. I think it's actually, that's a good question. It's important that you all understand. I have shown you every, the only things I haven't shown you was the implementation of the thing that renders the events on the screen that are boring. Um, but everything to do with server side events, you've seen it all. So it really is that straightforward. Yeah. Well, we're going to question like, hey, if you think I'm using web topics just to read it like, um, you know, I don't even, they just pull in the deleting them, I can get them from the web app, so I can use it one more project for that. So that's for example, we'll be able to do this for this, and then now I'm going to start to do this for this, because I do need to describe the phone with the deleting that's it. Yeah, you can do that. If you, um, you could probably run a pretty light page and do it in like a tiny, so you have to get in your application day, and then you can put a set of side events in there. I will say, though, the advantage of that can actually be don't have to run that easy. So, so that's a good example of why you might use WebSockets because it's your service data. Yes, but if you give it a website, you'll need Oh, you do? Love it. Yeah, so it's like Yeah, it's great. Um, what I have uh, responds to publishes on Reddit. So, yeah, it's a really good way to couple um, asynchronous notifications from a third party service mm -hmm. to your. Uh, Any other questions? I'll just throw up that URL if anyone wants it. Uh, and then otherwise, uh, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'll put that on the meetup. Yeah, that's perfect. All right, thanks for coming out, everybody. Uh, see, I think we've got a meetup in a month. Uh, we haven't got nothing yet. So if anybody's trying to pull stuff or wants to hear about it, their topic, please let us know so we can either do that or try to find somebody who knows that and so on. Good night. <laughs>